Is it a good idea to move to Canada this year? Number one is your earning potential in the next five to 10 years. The truth is that the size of your paycheck will largely influence the quality of life that you will be able to have in Canada. What matters is not just the absolute cost of living, we'll get to that later, I promise, but your income relative to the cost of living. Before you come to Canada, try to estimate your potential earnings in the next five to 10 years. You might only earn a minimum wage, for example, $16.50. 55 cents in Ontario in the beginning, but depending on your qualifications, you could be earning anywhere from $50,000 to $250,000 and even more in the mid and long term. Websites like Glassdoor is a great place to start researching what you can earn in Canada in different jobs. For example, as an office admin, you can expect to earn anything between $38,000 to $60,000, while as a senior accountant, you could be earning up to the high 90,000s or even more. So keep these salary ranges in mind when you're choosing a career and even field of study if you're coming here as a student. Bachelors in Linguistic. Think twice. And your total income can definitely increase if you are willing to work two jobs, have a side hustle, work self-employed, because there's basically an unlimited upside. Also very important, consider that a household of two people both working and combining their financial resources will definitely have it much easier. But apart from researching potential salaries, also don't forget to plug in that number that you think you will earn into a tax calculator to get an idea of how much you'll actually have left of that money after taxes. The second thing to consider before coming to Canada, of course, is the cost of living here. Yes, cost of living in Canada has always been high, but in the past few years, everything has just gone through the roof. On Numbio, it says that in 2024, excluding rent, you can expect to spend $5,600 per month for a family of four people or $1,542 per month for one person. Remember, excluding rent. $3.99 cents just for a liter of milk. $4.64 for a dozen of eggs. And if you're planning to drive here in Canada, $1.64 per liter of fuel. Now, if you tag on rent to that, that is by far the largest expense. And if you plan to live in the city center in Toronto, for example, you can expect to pay anywhere from $2,300 to $3,000 for a one bedroom apartment. If you're willing to live in a basement, you could probably still get that for around $1,500. So if we just take the very minimum, let's say $15, $1,500, which is increasingly hard to get, plus $1,500 per month for all your other expenses, that brings us to $3,000 per month for one person, or $36,000 per year. And you can further squeeze that a little if you're being very, very frugal. And keep in mind that living on your own single is usually more expensive, whereas living together with someone else or as a couple is usually cheaper because you get to share a lot of the expenses, like your utilities, your internet, and so on. This is the reality guys it is really expensive living in canada especially in big cities like toronto and vancouver so apart from just considering the cost of living or just considering your potential income consider your purchasing power here in canada compared to the country you're from or other countries that you're considering to move to and of course yes you will get away with a much much cheaper rent in other cities in canada for example in regina where a one-bedroom apartment in the city center costs a $1,127 on average, according to Numbio. Anyone living in Regina out there, let me know is this realistic or not. And you can even get a three bedroom in the city center of Regina for $1,437, which is a steal compared to Toronto. But then of course, you'll also need to consider whether or not moving to these cities, which have a lower rent, offer you the same job opportunities that you specifically with your skill set need, and also whether or not it fits your lifestyle. After spending so much money on rent, there's usually very little money left for the more fun things like traveling and entertainment. So it really helps helps to be resourceful and find creative ways that you can save on things like subscriptions, vacation expenses, like flight tickets, hotel bookings, and so on. And did you know that you can do that just by using a VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and the one I'm using and totally love is CyberGhost VPN. When your VPN is on, your IP address is hidden, making you anonymous on the web. It's as though you're browsing from different locations. All your traffic on the internet goes through an encrypted VPN tunnel, so you're protected from hackers who want to 
to steal your data. Also, CyberGhost has a no logs policy, so no one will know about your online activity. With CyberGhost VPN, you can also access geoblog content, movies, series that are available in other countries on over 40 streaming services, including Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and many more. You can also use CyberGhost VPN to find the cheapest hotel and flight deals, as depending on the country you browse from, you'll oftentimes get shown different prices. It's very easy to use and great for beginners. Just change your online location in three clicks. And their 24-7 customer support is there if you ever need help. CyberGhost VPN has over 38 million users and has an excellent rating on Trustpilot. If you sign up for CyberGhost right now, using my link in the descriptions, it will only cost you $2.03 per month. And you'll also get four months for free, the best deal ever. And you can save even more money by sharing your CyberGhost VPN subscription with your family and friends, as it covers up to seven devices. And it works on most operating platforms, including Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, Android, Smart TV, and even gaming consoles. There's no risk in trying out CyberGhost VPN as there's a 45-day money-back guarantee. Click on my link in the descriptions and try it out. And now back to the video. The third thing to consider before you come to Canada is Canada's economy and job opportunities. And by this, I don't just mean the very high level economic indicators like GDP. I mean, yes, Canada is the 10th largest economy in the world as of 2023. In 2022, Canada had a GDP of 2.14 trillion US dollars. These stats are all great, but so what? More important to consider is which of these economic developments affect you? Which sectors are booming and are experiencing a shortage in supply of workers and which jobs and skills are in demand? This point is much more than I can cover in just a few minutes, but looking at this website over here is a great start. Here are examples of some jobs that are in demand, in demand by the employer to be exact. Top 10 in demand jobs in Canada, for example, registered nurse with an average annual salary of $70,975. And you can especially expect to be paid a lot in these provinces like the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Yukon. Web developers also seem to be in demand, electrical engineers, truck drivers, welders, veterinarians, licensed practical nurse, industrial electrician, pharmacist, and accountant. So if you have qualifications that are currently in demand, or if you're willing to pivot your career career to something that will be in demand in the long term, then perhaps, yes, Canada might be the place for you to go. Now let's go on to the fourth thing to consider before coming to Canada, which is the environment of increasing crime, homelessness, and drug use. Although, of course, Canada is still a very, very safe country in the larger context worldwide, it is just not as safe as it used to be in the past. The environment has changed a bit and this is especially important to those of you who already have children or are planning to have them. Canada is seeing violent crime like never before. Crime has never been worse than it was in the 1990s. Homelessness, drug use is on the rise and record numbers of Canadians are being randomly attacked by people they've never met for seemingly no reason, which mostly seem to be a result of untreated mental illness. And I do want to be cautious here not to overblow this. Of course, everything is always more sensationalized in the news, but there is a grain of truth to it. So again, in the wider context, Canada is still very, very safe, especially compared to many, many other countries in the world. In 2024, the magazine Time Out ranked Canada as the safest country to travel to. Of course, the safety levels in different cities and provinces will vary a lot. And of course, depending on the study you look at, Canada will be ranked 5th, 10th, 15th, 20th, and so on. But it is still pretty much up there in terms of safety. Canada, yes, is still much safer compared to many other countries. But of course, there is also another way to look at this depending on your perspective. If you come from another country that also scores very high in terms of safety, for example, Singapore, Japan, or Switzerland, depending on your view, you may think that the general environment over there might be better for your kids, so you will want to consider it carefully. And again, I'm not saying which choice is better, I'm just saying that that is one aspect that you need to consider. The next thing has a lot to do with community. The fifth thing to think about when you're considering whether or not you should move to Canada is the social life here. I know there is a debate on whether or not it is easy to make friends in Canada, how easy or how difficult it is, but this section is not about that. 
this is more about the general way of life and also how many people in terms of number of family and friends you have around you on a daily basis when you come from countries in southeast asia and i just make a guess here also south america perhaps then you'd likely be used to big crowds and having a lively atmosphere everywhere you would usually meet with family and even extended families for gathering celebrations and it's not something that you need to meticulously schedule but it just comes naturally you'd often have friends or family members who drop by your house spontaneously and vice versa but in canada it's a bit different and i'm not saying that it is a bad thing it's just a different culture some like it some don't if you ask me personally i do love having my personal space here but some people who just prefer being amongst a lot of people most of the time can probably get lonely here pretty easily especially if they're moving here on their own without their family in canada i would say that you need to take the extra mile if you want to meet a lot of people so that's just something to consider the sixth thing to consider is the weather exciting and controversial topic is it really that cold no, it's not that cold. Ooh, it's freezing. No, it's okay. What are you saying? Canada is a freezer. I would say it's a personal thing. Some like it hot, some like it cold. But the fact is, I would say that for about half of the year, the weather is cool at least to cold. In Toronto, for example, temperatures will drop to around 10 degrees Celsius in October and then further drop to minus 20 degrees or even colder in January and February. And it won't get to the double digits again until around April. And granted, in the summer, in midsummer, it can get very hot, even up to 35 degrees Celsius for a week or two. So that's the other extreme. So I would say that it depends whether or not you enjoy this kind of weather and these four seasons. I mean, some people, including myself, enjoy it. And if you prefer to have a bit milder weather, then Vancouver on the West Coast is definitely much better than Toronto in terms of weather. But overall, I'd say that Canada is colder than most, not all, European countries. And of course, much, much colder than countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and South America. And the kind of weather you have will definitely affect your lifestyle. Is it more sledding, ice skating and snowboarding or more beach sun shorts and bikinis? Now let's go on to item number seven to consider before you make your move to Canada, which is the healthcare system. It's not a secret anymore that Canada indeed has the best perceived healthcare system in the world. I know many of you will chuckle at this, primarily because healthcare is free, for example, through health plans like OHIP in Ontario, although you do eventually pay for it through your taxes. <coughs> <clears throat> but for minor ailments, I would say that the Canadian healthcare system works just fine. Go to the doctor for free and pretty soon the CDCP or the Canadian Dental Care Plan is coming to Ontario as well. And the quality of medical care, I'd say, is very good on a global scale. But I know you've been waiting for this. If you have a more serious medical condition that requires you to see a specialist on a regular basis, then it can get tricky. Canada, yes, is unfortunately known for its long, long waiting lines to see a specialist. Here it says, specialist physicians surveyed report a median waiting time of 27.4 weeks between referral from a general practitioner and receipt of treatment. Longer than the wait of 25.6 weeks reported in 2021. So not only is the waiting time super long, but it's also increasing. So in case you or anyone in your family coming along with you to Canada has a rather serious medical condition, then I'd recommend you to do some further research and consider this one very, very carefully. Now let's go on to number eight, something that you need to consider before you make the decision of moving to Canada is the immigration surge. This is just something that I need to throw out there. Immigration in the past few years has surged immensely. Yes, I recently made a video on why so many people are leaving Canada, which is also known as onward migration, meaning immigrants coming to Canada and then leaving again. And it's right, there's also an uptick in that. But still, overall, on a macro scale, the numbers are positive. Net immigration is positive and rising. Nearly one in four people in Canada are immigrants, the highest proportion of the population in more than 150 years, as you can see from this chart here. And yes, it's true, Canada needs immigrants to rejuvenate their population. Close to two-thirds of recent immigrants are of core working age 
rejuvenating Canada's aging population, which in terms of the effect on the demographic proportions is a positive effect. But of course, while there are opportunities with immigration, there are also risks associated with this accelerating number of immigration. Here in the Toronto Sun, it said Canada has added more than 1 million people and counting in 2023, it's unsustainable. Don't get me wrong, I'm an immigrant myself. And as much as I also want other people to have the same chance like I did to come to Canada, there is something to be said about the miscalculations and unpreparedness of the Canadian government in accepting this number of immigrants. The problem is not that Canada does not have enough land, but it does not have the matching infrastructure to support the rising number of immigrants. There's just not enough housing and it will be really difficult for incoming immigrants and even Canadians who are already here to find housing. So this is just something really important to know to manage your expectations should you decide to come to Canada. And now guys, we're getting to the last two points that might just veto all of your other considerations when you're pondering about whether or not to move to Canada. Item number nine has to do with politics or even broader politics, religion, and cultural considerations. And honestly, this is one thing that I've never ever thought of before moving to Canada. What I really wanted at that time was to move back to a Western country, having lived in Germany for about half of my life previously. But this time I wanted to move to an English speaking country as that would be much, much easier for my husband. And I just had no idea of the politics and the cultural climate here in Canada. And guys, I really don't want to go into this topic too much, but it just suffices to say that if you're someone who holds strong religious and cultural beliefs, then you'd probably not like certain aspects of life in Canada. So anyways, it's a really good idea to research the political and cultural climate here in Canada first before you make that big decision. And I also want to share with you this awesome resource from Nomad Capitalist. Nomad Capitalist ranks citizenships, passports of different countries based on things like access to travel to other countries, taxation, and freedom. So if you plan to move to Canada, especially for the long term, then do check out this website. So let's just zoom in on this last bit here. They assign Canada a freedom score of 30, which translates to intermediate freedom on a scale from 10 to 50, 50 being most free. A score of 30 in terms of freedom might not be exactly what you'd expect from an advanced nation like Canada. And yes, sorry, that's all I have to say on this topic for today. If you guys want to learn more, I highly recommend this other channel here. This guy really makes awesome videos about political and cultural commentary of Canada. Now, the last item that could also veto your decision is purpose related reasons. Yes, I know we're getting into philosophical terrain here, but hear me out. Some people move to Canada simply because they have family here and they want to reunite, or you might even have some bigger reasons. There are so many ways to go about the decision process to move to another country. One way is to look at which country treats you the best and which country could make your life easier. Or on the other hand, you could also decide to stay in a country or to move to a country despite all of the things that you dislike. Because perhaps, perhaps, just perhaps you might see yourself as somebody who might play a pivotal role in changing the direction of that country. And I'm not saying that either ways of making a decision is right or wrong. I just say that it's really important to know what your purpose is, what your priorities in your life are. Was there anything that I forgot to mention? If so, do let me know in the comments below. And also don't forget to check out CyberGhost VPN. Click on my link in the descriptions below to get their awesome deal for just $2.03 per month plus four months free. This application will protect your data while you browse and give you full access to all blocked content on the internet. And if you change your mind for whatever reason, you can get your money back within 45 days. So there's no risk. Thank you so much for watching guys and I'll see you pretty soon in the next video. Bye.